Now this is probably something we're fairly familiar with, diabetes mellitus being divided into type 1 and type 2. And then there's additional forms that we're probably familiar with that we've been talking about for some time now. Latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, also autoimmune like the type 1 but with a, a, an onset later in life. And then maturity onset diabetes of the young, so so-called MODI. There's lots of anachronisms with uh, diabetes. LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. Moody, maturity onset diabetes of the young. Very strong genetic element in this one. More related to the type 2 though, I would say. Then of course there's uh, gestational diabetes coming on in pregnancy really a separate form but most commonly it's more akin to type 2 and if someone does have diabetes in pregnancy they're much more likely to get diabetes mellitus type 2 in later life and then another one that's probably more common than we have thought is um, secondary diabetes pancreatogenic caused by disease of the pancreas such as chronic pancreatitis sometimes caused by gallstones, sometimes caused by alcohol, Cushing's disease, steroids, side effect of longer term steroid therapy, cystic fibrosis. Um, these are all associated with the diminishment of exocrine as well as endocrine functions of the pancreas, this particular group. So what's the new research saying then? Is it overturning this or do we have to um, relearn what we already know? Well, the answer to that is basically no, we don't. But what the new thinking has done is it gives us five clusters. Five clusters. Now, this is based on research done in um, Scandinavia, mostly Finland and Sweden. And they used um, criteria, large scale epidemiological study, epidemiology at its best actually. Um, and they used six criteria. The presence of autoantibodies which would indicate the traditional type 1 diabetes, the age at diagnosis, the body mass index because for a long time of course we've noted that obesity and increased body ma mass index is related to type 2 diabetes, the HbA1c which is the glycosylated haemoglobin levels in the blood, the beta cell function, how much insulin the beta cells are still able to produce and the degree to which someone has insulin resistance. So in insulin resistance, even though the person is producing insulin or is being given insulin, the cells aren't able to use it properly. So they use these six criteria. So we're still talking about diabetes mellitus, of course. It's the same disease. But they came up with clusters. Now, the first cluster they came up with <clears throat> based on about 15,000 patients is cluster one. Now cluster one they describe as severe autoimmune diabetes, SAID, and this accounted for actually 6.4% of the patients in the study. So um, fortunately not too common, although because diabetes is common um, it represents a lot of individuals. Now Severe autoimmune diabetes, SAID, um, early onset of disease, disease starts at a young age, very often tragically in childhood or in adolescence or young adult life. And this essentially corresponds with the, uh, the type 1 diabetes mellitus that we already know about. So that's corresponding quite highly with the type 1 diabetes. And it also includes the uh, LADA classification, the uh, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. So the, the, these are both included in this, uh, in this cluster one, severe autoimmune diabetes. Patients tend to have a relatively low body mass index. Without treatment, they have very poor metabolic and glycemic control and they have a deficiency of insulin, in fact oft, often an absolute deficiency of insulin. So this is impaired insulin production for autoimmune reasons. 
And these patients also have what we call GAD antibodies. GAD antibodies. So cluster one have the GAD antibodies. GAD antibodies. And these are what, what we would expect. They, they are immunological antibodies. It stands for uh, glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies. Now, what actually happens is <clears throat> when there's autoimmune breakup, imagine this is a pancreatic beta cell producing insulin in the pancreatic, pan pancreatic eye. That's a long hand. Now, there's this stuff... Uh, GAD happily working away inside the cell. Glutamic acid decarboxylase enzyme working away inside the cell doing things. But then when the cell is damaged and ruptures then you can see the GAD can simply escape. So now we have GAD just floating around in the circulation. Not supposed to be there in the circulation, it's supposed to be inside the cell so antibodies can be produced to that. It's almost recognised as a foreign protein even though it's the body's own. It's not supposed to be in the circulation where it has access to the antibodies. So it's one of the autoantibodies. And, and there are many types of autoantibodies actually have been identified but this one is useful for uh, testing, for, um, for um, me measuring the levels of the antibody in the blood to aid the diagnosis. Now whether it's the uh, GAD antibodies that cause the cell to rupture or whether it's a side effect of the cell rupturing is less clear. I think it's probably a side effect of the cell rupturing. But anyway we get these GAD antibodies with cluster 1 which includes the traditional type 1 diabetes and it includes the uh, the larder latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. So that's the first cluster in this new classification. So diabetes mellitus, cluster one up there, a severe autoimmune diabetes. Now, now the second cluster they identified, obviously they called cluster two, severe insulin deficient diabetes. So again, there is a lack of insulin in this group. Severe insulin deficient diabetes, SID. And this accounted for about 17.5% of the patients that they identified, newly diagnosed with diabetes mellitus. Now, patients with SID are similar in many ways to patients with SAID, in that they're not producing insulin. But they are GAD negative. They don't have the antibodies. They don't have the autoantibodies these circulating antibodies that indicate the autoimmune nature of the type 1 disease. They have a high HbA1c because they have a low amount of insulin. And unfortunately this group was found to have the highest incidence of retinopathy as well. And, and this, this makes sense really with the observations. For, for years I've been coming across patients who are not particularly overweight but develop what we assumed was, was type 2 diabetes. So really we need this more refined classification to identify disease mechanisms, to individualise treatments and already starting to predict complications. And there are genetic bases, the genetic evidence is now available to differentiate some of these conditions some of these cluster groups, indicating that they are indeed separate diseases and not simply stages of a disease. Next cluster identified was uh, cluster three. And again, this is described as severe disease. And this is what we think of as the very traditional type two diabetes. So they had severe insulin resistant diabetes. So to begin with, these patients can actually produce plenty of insulin. But then they can't use the insulin that they are producing because of insulin resistance. Because of course, as you've 
know if you watch the other videos in this series, we need the interaction between the insulin itself and the insulin receptor on the surface of the cells to facilitate the gating of glucose into the cell. So that was the third type, thinking that this is the traditional stereotype almost of type 2. Um, increased body mass index, insulin resistance, and uh, this group had the highest incidence of diabetic nephropathy. Probably other complications as well, but the evidence is in on the nephropathy one at the moment. So they're the three severe forms of the disease. Now there are two milder forms as well, and these are cluster groups four and cluster group five. Now cluster group four is mild obesity related diabetes. So it is obesity related. This accounted for 22%. This was 15% of the new cases. This was 22% of the new cases in the Scandinavian study. So mild obesity related diabetes, MOD, obesity, younger age, but they did not have the insulin resistance, so respond well to insulin therapy. But that's described as a milder one, less likely to develop longer term complications. In the past, we used to say there's no such thing as mild diabetes, and, and that, that's true to an extent, but these are milder forms than the severe forms in this new cluster-based classification. Severe, 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 mild. And then the fifth, fifth form, mild age-related diabetes, so-called MARD, occurring in older people, older age of onset, and modest metabolic alterations. Blood glucose levels not particularly high. So really, um, Clusters one and two, or cl no, cluster one, just cluster one really, is the, uh, the type one. So we could think of all these others as, as subclassifications of type two. In fact, that's probably the best way to think about it. So cluster groups two, three, four, and five as being subtypes of the type 2 diabetes, giving us an individualized genetic profile to allow prediction of the disease, meaning that we can give a more precise diagnosis, meaning that treatment can be more specifically tailored. Now, while this was an excellent epidemiological study carried out on large numbers of people, it was on a fairly homogeneous population. Diabetes, of course, is a global pandemic. There's masses of diabetes all over the world. And uh, further replication studies need to be done. But this five cluster groups is, I believe, an exceptionally useful step forward in our thinking about diabetes and individualizing diagnosis. And it also makes sense of observations we've had in the past that didn't quite fit into the stereotypical type 1, type 2 classifications but do fit in more accurately into these new cluster-based classifications.